Prior to the release of RDNA 2, I used information available in leaks to estimate the performance of both RDNA 2, Big Navi, and the upcoming RTX 3000 series, and I suggested that the RTX 3080 would be faster than the 2080 Ti with much greater ray tracing performance. And the 3080 came out and was 16% faster and indeed had much greater ray tracing performance. There was more information about Big Navi and I was able to get a little bit more specific in that case. I suggested a 20 teraflop card with around a 20,000 point time spy score. The 6800 XT has 20 teraflops and the 6900 XT has 23 and it has about a 19,000 time spy score. Not bad for four and a half months before release. High on that success, I thought I'd try again. Enough information has come to light recently that I think we can start talking about RDNA 3's performance. In March of 2022, AMD announced they were splitting their GPU lines into cDNA for the HPC and data center space and RDNA for gaming and desktop. These are quite different architectures doing different roles, but they do share some technology and they share a manufacturing process. These lines are likely to diverge even more in the future, but for now they have some useful similarities. CDNA1 and RDNA1 and 2 both use TSMC 7 nanometer process. The next evolution of CDNA will use TSMC's 5 nanometer process. We expect this is also true for RDNA3. We also expect both of these will use an MCM or multi-chip module architecture. This is all but confirmed for CDNA2. Before we get into RDNA3 then, we need to have a look at CDNA2 and the jump in the performance between versions 1 and 2. Here are the specs of the MI100. We can't make any direct comparisons because the official specs for the MI200 have not been released. Luckily for us though, AMD is pretty heavily involved in the open source scene and so we do have some information in the Linux kernel which we can use. And that's how we can confirm it's definitely a 2 die part. But we do not know the clock speeds and cannot gauge performance without them. We can, however, infer very rough clocks and performance from some loosely defined performance numbers from the Satonic supercomputer, which will use these accelerators. These numbers won't be accurate, but they might just be in the right ballpark. The press release for this supercomputer system claims 50 petaflops from 750 plus MI200 cards. The system is likely to consist of 1600 nodes using dual socket EPIC CPUs, which themselves would provide around 6.4 petaflops. We don't know if that is being counted in the total performance numbers, and the plus in 750 plus is a problem. 800 would fit into 1600s evenly, but we have no idea how this system will be configured. Is it 751 cards? Is it 1000? We just don't know. Assuming a nice round 800, and assuming that the CPU performance is also being counted in the total, we're left with 54.5 teraflops per card. But honestly, it could be anywhere with a wide range from 50 to slightly over 60 teraflops. But I think this is a reasonable guess and it gets us to 2.45 times the performance of the previous MI100. I'd say the card will be at least two times faster, probably closer to 2.4, perhaps even as much as 2.5 or slightly higher. With that in mind, let's jump to RDNA 3. We know there's a move to five nanometer. We know there's a move to an MCM dual die architecture. We know there'll be a slight clock increase. There are many designs we could play with. Let's start with a fictional 7800 and see what we get. A design such as this could be 60% faster than the RTX 3090 or 80% faster than the 6900 XT within the same TDP envelope. Although it's not two or three times faster, I don't think anybody would be disappointed with a 60 to 80% performance increase over the fastest GPUs currently available, especially if prices were lower and availability higher. Native 4K with ray tracing at 120 frames per second for $600 to $800? Sign me up, I'll take two please. Perhaps you're more in the market for a replacement 6700 XT. 40% faster than RTX 3090. To me, all this sounds fantastic, but we haven't even gone big yet. Let's have a look at the 7900 XT, or at least a hypothetical version of it. We have our core increase, we have our frequency increase. If AMD's stacked cache is involved, we increase our L3 Infinity Cache, and along with it, an IPC gain. On the CPU side, we saw a 12% boost from this tech in gaming workloads. The L3 greatly improved efficiency in RDNA 2, so there's a good chance increasing this helps to compensate for this big increase in cores. Now this rather simplistic equation of just the cores, frequency and IPC gain 
can lead to reasonably accurate predictions because at the end of the day it just comes down to the physical limits of the manufacturing process. Counting transistors and teraflops is easy. Where things get difficult is in efficiency. So much of the secret sauce in a chip architecture is down to reducing memory accesses, keeping the data as close to the computation as possible, or eliminating memory accesses altogether. Ampere used GDDR6X to increase memory bandwidth, whereas AMD used Infinity Cache to try and reduce accesses altogether, keeping more data local. Fixed function units in a chip are great, but they don't work unless they have fast access to data. So as more information comes to light on these chips, I'll be looking closely at the memory architecture. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get back to our 7900 XT specs. 10,000 shaders, 2.3 gigahertz boost, with 21,000 times by extreme points, double the speed of a 3090, and 2.3 times the speed of the 6900 XT. You want 8K gaming, because that's how you get 8K gaming. But before we get too excited, there are many variables we need to consider. We don't know the shader counts, more or less. We don't know how much improved the ray tracing accelerators will be. I have to assume somewhat, but we'll get to that later. We're taking a guess at the IPC based only on the addition of stacked cache, but it could be more, it could be less. There could also be additional IPC gains from other areas. Right now we're assuming uh, GDDR6, but we don't really know the speeds. We also don't know what are the overheads from an MCM approach. Scheduling jobs and tens of thousands of threads doesn't come for free. It takes die area to do that. It takes computation, it takes power. There's inter-die communication and latency overheads. There's keeping the caches all in sync. So many details here we don't yet know. With this new MCM approach, clock speeds aren't as simple as they were before. It's not just boost or sustain clocks as each die can boost independently of the other, giving some flexibility. One die could boost for twice as long, both could boost for half as long but get more done, boosting could flip back and forth between each depending on what workloads were active, or the boosting could be limited to whichever has the better silicon. They could boost to different peaks depending on their respective efficiency curves. Think combining Ryzen boost behaviors with SmartShift in a single package. Now we also need to think about the Infinity Cache. We know the Zen 3 prototype used Vcache on one of the dies, enabling it to double from 32 to 64 megabyte of L3. RDNA 3 could similarly double its 128 meg to 256 meg, double that again for each die for a total of 512. But there's a chance that's a low estimate. The 64 meg SRAM used on the prototype chip was 6 by 6 mils, 36 mils squared, taking up about half the surface area. At that density, half of a theoretical 300 millimeter square 7900 XT would give us 512 meg per die, or 1 gig in total of L3. That's where the BVH structure for RT is located. RT performance could see a significant increase simply by increasing this, with no other optimizations. One of the reasons AMD takes a bigger hit when enabling RT over NVIDIA is because the BVH structure has to share some space in the Affinity Cache, along with other game data and textures. Enabling RT can instantly put more pressure on the memory subsystem, which, being just 256-bit, isn't very fast. RDNA 2's intersection tests are done on dedicated hardware units, but BVH traversal is done with shaders. Flexible requires fewer transistors, but puts some additional pressure on CUs when RT is enabled. There could be some hardware changes here, but I don't know. Potentially with an increase in Infinity Cache and maybe some alterations to how BVH traversal is done, there could be substantial increases to the ray tracing performance. Alright, we've talked a lot about RDNA 3 because there's a little bit more to go on, but I think we can also touch on NVIDIA's RTX 4000 series, or codenamed Lovelace the AD102 chip. If overall efficiency is roughly the same as Ampere, then that puts it almost exactly in the same ballpark as the 7900 XT. Last generation I thought AMD would have something competitive with RDNA 2, but I did not think that they would beat Nvidia in the ultimate performance crown. This generation around? I don't know. And that's great. 
But last gen, AMD took me by surprise with the Infinity Cache, and Nvidia shocked me with the 2x FP32. With RDNA 3 and Lovelace, I fully expect some new curveballs to be thrown. There's a lot I don't know, but what this analysis has cemented for me is the rumors we're hearing about 2 to 2.5 times gen on gen performance increases should absolutely be taken seriously. But since we've come this far, let's get a bit silly. What if the top end RDNA 3 part looked a little bit more like its data center counterpart? I do not think it would for reasons of yields and margins, but uh, just because we're here, let's take a look. The MI100 is a 750 mil square chip. At 5 nanometer, that can come down to around about 400 millimeter. And with a 15% frequency gain, that gets us up to 1.7 gigahertz. And let's max out that infinity cache. And now we're talking about 50 teraflops, almost 50,000 points on TimeSpy, 24,000 in TimeSpy Extreme. This is 2.5 times the 6900 XT with only a 12% IPC gain assumed. Although, I have to think that it could be higher than that. I'm erring on the side of caution, I'm being pessimistic, but with a greatly enhanced infinity cache and architectural changes which I assume run a whole gamut, we could be looking at 15 to 20% IPC. Rumors have said that AMD will stick to a 256-bit bus for RDNA 3, but that could be 256-bit per core. Everything we know about the MI200 and everything that's in AMD's active bridge patent indicates each die has its own physical interfaces to memory. Now, AMD could have a 128-bit bus per die, they could have 256 per die, or 256 on one die only, the second die having to send all access requests over the bridge. And AMD likely has a lot of flexibility here. The patent does specifically say that this active bridge is used to access physical memory channels on another die. That would seem to make sense and it lines up with CDNA too. So if I was being more optimistic than pessimistic, here's what I think a 7900 XT might look like. Clocks and cores remain the same. Memory bandwidth is doubled. Active bridge with a ton of L3 and greatly improved ray tracing. In this configuration, I easily see a path to 2.5 times faster than the 6900 XT. Will the next gen be double the speed? Absolutely. Will they be 2.5 times faster? Don't rule it out. But the high end is one thing. I think the real excitement is probably going to be at the lower end. And one final thing, AMD has a roadmap to four chiplets. The funny thing about four is it comes after three.